Hi everyone, today I'm going to talk a little bit about aquatic insects, and this is actually one of my favorite parts of freshwater ecology. Um, and this is because there's such a huge diversity of life um, that most people don't ever encounter. Um, even if you're walking through a stream, you can not even notice a lot of the species that are living at the bottom of that, or even in the water. So this is something that really got me interested in, in freshwater ecology as an undergraduate. First, a quick refresher on some general info um, that'll be relevant today. Um, the first are two terms, lintic and lotic, that refer to different types of uh, aquatic ecosystems. Um, lintic systems have standing water, including ponds and lakes, um, whereas lotic systems have flowing water, including streams and rivers. Um, and now some general info about insects. Um, there are over a million species that have been documented on Earth in total, uh, including all groups of organisms. Um, and over half of them are insects, um, but only about two to 3% of those insects are aquatic at some point in their life cycle. Um, and so it's kind of a unique group to be studying and, and they're, they're pretty neat. Um, you see a lot of cool life forms. Uh, we'll go through them later on. Um, insects um, of all um, sort of groups are known for having six legs in their adult stage. Um, there are three main segments to an insect body, um, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. And those will be important to remember when you're working through some of the ID, because um, occasionally there's a structure on either the head, the thorax, or the abdomen um, that, that is really identifying characteristic of a certain group. Um, and so it's, you know, it's gonna make it a lot easier if you remember those terms, um, and you'll know exactly where to look when it mentions, you know, if there's um, filaments coming off the end of the abdomen, um, you'll know that it's sort of the tail end of that organism, um, the furthest away from the head. <clears throat> um, insects have varying mouth parts that we'll use to ID them as well. Um, and so those are always located on the head as well as the uh, antennae um, and eyes. Um, there are two types of eyes. The ocellus is a sort of a simple eye that um, just detects, you know, um, sort of light intensity. Um, whereas the compound eye um, are much more developed and they are more, have more sophisticated uh, vision. Um, the wings are always located on the thorax as well as the, the legs. And then on the abdomen, um, there's various organs, the reproductive organs are down there and there'll also be some filaments and, and maybe some gills that we'll use to identify some groups of insects. So why do we even care about insects? Um, well, first, they're a major component of the food chain. Um, so they get eat, eaten by a lot of things, a lot of fish um, that are really important for recreation, um, rely on aquatic insects uh, as a major part of their diet, um, and they also eat things. Um, and so not only are they maybe grazing on algae, um, but a lot of them will uh, actually aid in decomposition of coarse organic matter, such as weeds and, and woody debris that falls in the stream. Um, it's because these insects will actually be Sort of scraping, you know, microbes that are growing in biofilms on these items, and in the meantime, they sort of break those up, so they increase the surface area, and, and basically speed up decomposition by increasing the surface area of that coarse organic matter. Um, second, they're really important indicators of aquatic health. Um, there's just particularly three groups: uh, the EPT taxa, that's Ephemeroptera, the mayflies. Plecoptera, the stoneflies, and Trichoptera, the caddisflies. Um, and within these groups, there are a lot of species that are very tolerant um, of pollution. And then there's others that are very intolerant. Um, and so by looking at sort of the, which species are present within these groups, you can get an idea of what water quality like is like in that system. Third, um, aquatic insects have a big influence on human health. Um, so mosquitoes, um, are actually generally aquatic as larvae, um, and, and they spread all sorts of diseases across the world, and including malaria. Um, so aquatic insects are very important for um, disease vectors. And also they just bite people. <laughs> so they're, they're generally, uh, or a lot of these insects can be considered nuisance species. Not all of them, um, but a lot of flies, you know, people will pay money not to have them around. Um, whether it's screening in a porch or burning like a citronella candle. Um, these nuisances um, do have an impact on human life on a day-to-day -day basis. And finally, since they're major components of a lot of fish diets, um, 
a lot of fishing lures are designed to basically mimic what an aquatic insect is going to look like. Um, so there are a lot of really neat mayfly ones out there. And you can see that like an example down here in the lower right. <clears throat> Up top here, that's a picture of a bunch of mosquito larvae. So there are a few major advantages to being underwater. Um, the first is avoidance of desiccation. You don't have to worry about drying out if you're living in the water. And, and most terrestrial insects really struggle with this, drying out. Um, another big struggle of um, terrestrial insects is freezing where it's cold. Um, and so in streams um, and, and just any water body really, um, environmental conditions are generally more stable. Um, there's lower temperature fluctuations as compared to the air. Um, and you also get some freeze protection in the winter. Um, Cause you remember that um, ice is most dense at four degrees Celsius. And so ice or um, water bodies freeze from the top down. So as long as you're in a deep enough um, sort of body of water or one that's flowing fast enough, um, you basically avoid this, this problem of freezing when it's cold. Um, and then the last major one here is gonna be an abundant supply of microorganisms. Um, these microorganisms organisms benefit from the two things I just mentioned up top here. Um, and so there's a lot of, of them usually in, in lakes and streams. Uh, that uh, It represents a really important um, food resource for these organisms. Now, one of the major problems of living underwater is that oxygen diffuses much more slowly underwater. Um, and so there have been a lot of adaptations that insects have used um, to basically efficiently get um, oxygen for their metabolism. The first we'll talk about is called aeronustic. Um, and so these are organisms that get oxygen from the atmosphere. <clears throat> and they can either keep in contact with the air. Um, a good example of this are the water striders that are really common around Kansas. And they, they actually sit on top of the water. Um, and so they, they're always in contact with, with the atmosphere so they can just breathe as a normal terrestrial insect would. Um, the second way um, that aeronustic organisms have, have evolved to get oxygen is taking it with them. And so they'll come up to the surface periodically, but then they can dive and swim around underneath the water. Um, to either gather food, you know, or, or whatever they need to do. And there's two main um, sort of ways that they can take this, this air with them as, after they go back underneath the water. Some have hydrofuge hairs. Um, and so these are hairs that are generally pretty close together. Um, and then they create this surface tension um, underneath water. And it actually leaves like an air bubble underneath in between those hairs. And so you can trap air bubbles with these hydrofuge hairs. Um, there's also other um, organisms that have something called a plastron. And, and that's just a bunch of uh, tiny hairs um, that also basically just captures bubbles of air um, thanks to you know, surface tension of water. Um, it, it's you know, high enough that the water won't totally saturate those hairs, that there'll be air bubbles trapped in between the hairs. Um, and so these insects can breathe from these air bubbles that they take with them underneath the water. And yeah, the big advantage of this is sort of being able to dive and swim around. And there's a lot of, you know, food resources, like we mentioned, both microorganisms and other insects that live underwater. Um, and so it can be important to be able to dive down there and catch different food items. Um, this, the second major pathway of breathing for insects um, these are insects that are hydronustic, so they use oxygen that's dissolved in the water. Um, and once again, there's two big categories of this. Um, first is cutaneous respiration, um, which is often used by diptera, which are the true flies, and plecoptera, which are stone flies. Um, and this occurs when the cuticle, the, basically the, the exoskeleton of that organism, is thin enough for air to diffuse directly in and out across that membrane. Um, and it essentially allows, it, uh, it allows an insect to remain underwater indefinitely because they don't need to get air from the atmosphere to get it all from the water. Um, the second big thing um, that insects can use to get oxygen from the water are called tracheal gills. 
Um, and so these are actually gills that are external to the body usually, and they're an extension of the, the, the tracheal system, which is just the, the, the method that insects, all insects use to breathe is through these things called trachea. Um, and so if you're not doing continuous respiration, you have a system of um, almost like blood vessels, but there's no fluid. They just allow air to diffuse throughout the insect body. And there's two types here. There's lamellate, which are generally like flat and kind of feathery. Um, and then there's filamentous gills too, which are just kind of like a straight filament coming from the body. Kind of a fun fact here. Um, oh, there's a typo. This is supposed to be Odonata, so O-D-O-N-A-T-A. -A. Those are the dragonflies and damselflies. Um, so the dragonflies specifically don't have external gills, but they have their gills inside of their abdomen. And they can pump water to these gills through their anus. And then they can blow that uh, water back out and basically use that as a quick propulsion method. Uh, um, yeah, quick method of propulsion. So they can move really fast. Um, another major issue when, when living underneath the water, at least in lotic systems, is that just that flow. Um, it's going to want to dislodge things, especially during floods, and move them downstream. And that's not always ideal if you're an organism that's, that's trying to eat and, and grow in a certain habitat. Um, and so there's a bunch of cool adaptations that organisms have to deal with this flow. Um, you know, the, the true flyers, the diptera again, often have suckers that they sort of use as a suction cup to stay, stay put. Um, there's also hooks. So we can see those on the Helgramites, which are in the Megaloptra order here. They actually have these hooks coming off the end of their abdomen um, that they can use to grasp all into rocks, um, you know, or woody debris or whatever they have. Um, another big thing here is just the body shape. So this is a mayfly here in the Heptogeneidae order, or family, sorry. Um, <clears throat> so it's in the family Heptogeneidae. Um, and they just have their body adapted to, to take advantage of the flow boundary near solid surfaces underneath water. So you can see that it's, it's basically hugging this rock here. And it's so low to the ground as well as generally flat body shape. Um, and so it can take advantage of that, that flow boundary layer that develops just due to pure physics. Um, and then they can use that and take it to their advantage to basically stay put and avoid being displaced and moved downstream. Um, some other organisms, organisms just have like sticky secretions. Um, this is uh, really common with insects that lay eggs near streams. So it'll be in just like this uh, sort of adhesive, you know, um, mass essentially. And so they stick them like underneath a trunk or something that's fallen into the stream. And then last was a really cool, um, the caddisflies in the order of Trichoptera um, actually build cases um, out of various materials. Um, some people even make money off dumping in a bunch of like gold flakes in to a, a, a mayfly tank or a caddisfly tank, sorry. So they'll dump gold in with the caddisfly and then the caddisfly makes a case out of the particles and then they'll, they'll like take the case out and sell it as jewelry. Um, so it's kind of a neat, um, human use of aquatic insects. So now I'm going to move on to the commonly encountered orders that we'll find here. The first of the mayflies, um, this is a Femeroptera. Remember this is one of those aquatic ind indicator um, taxa. Um, the best way to identify these organisms um, on their larvae are these three filaments coming off the end of their abdomen. Um, pretty much they're the only group you'll find just these pure like these straight filaments that are coming off the abdomen like that. Um, when um, mayflies are, are living in the streams um, they're generally collectors they'll either like you know, collect food food resources by moving around the stream bottom or, or scrapers so a good example of that's like our heptogeneity here um, and they'll just like scrape um, biofilms essentially as like a microbial food resource off of rocks and, and whatnot. The pictures, um, right, this is a picture of the adult form, which occasionally you'll find. Um, you'll especially sometimes find like their, their cases. Um, so the mayflies will emerge from the stream as nymphs. Um, then they'll molt into their adult form and leave behind this case. You can often find those. 
Next big one are the stoneflies, which is another um, sensitive aquatic indicator taxa. Um, these have the same general life cycle as mayflies, but the, you can easily tell them apart because Phacoptera just have two of these caudal filaments coming off the end of their abdomen. Um, the mayflies have three, the stoneflies have two, um, and so this is also just kind of the, the, the best way to identify a stonefly is generally these filaments. Um, and, and these organisms are, are, are mostly shredders, um, so they'll be shredding apart, you know, leaves or other food resources and actually like tearing that up and sort of aiding decomposition while getting microbial food resources in the, in the meantime. Third, we've got um, Odonata, and so it's spelled correctly up here now. Um, there are two big suborders within the order of Odonata. Um, the first is dragonflies, which are in the Anisoptera suborder, and damselflies, which are in the Zygoptera suborder. Both groups are highly predaceous. They have these really neat um, mouth parts um, where the, their lower lip, which is called the labium, um, assists in prey acquisition. It sort of forms this, this shovel-like you know, appendage almost with little pincers on it. Um, if you click on the link and, and watch this pretty short PBS video, um, you'll be able to see it in action. It's really cool how these things catch their prey. Sometimes they'll even eat fish. So if you search dragonfly eats fish, you probably find some cool stuff. Um, you can easily tell these two suborders apart because there are no external gills in the dragonflies. This is a dragonfly right here. Um, so there's no gills here. These are just little um, projections coming off their abdominal segments. Those are not gills. The gills are actually inside the abdomen. Uh, and then this is a damselfly larvae, um, and they do have three external gills coming off the end of their abdomen. Um, this is different from the mayflies. The mayflies have three filaments, and so they're just like straight, you know, hairs almost. Um, whereas the damselfly ones are often more fan-like. They're sort of broad, almost shaped like a leaf. And then if you're catching any adults, we didn't get any this year. But the dragonflies have their wings way flat, and they're generally a little bit larger overall than damselflies, but their body is a little bit shorter. And then the damselflies, such as this one right here, they're often very slender and elongate, um, and then they have their wings held vertically up over their body. Next is a hemiptera. Um, so the best way to identify this group is their beak. So they all have these little beaks as mouth parts. Um, <clears throat> they, they generally, um, some of them have wing pads, um, but if they do have wings, um, the wings often overlap, so one will kind of lay on top of the other. And there's just a ton of different life forms of these. We've caught a, a pretty good diversity in our collection this year. And um, yeah, they're, they're pretty cool to look at, just how diverse sort of the, the general body plan is. Next, we've got these caddisflies, so it's an order of Trichoptera. Um, they're closely related to, to Lepidoptera. Um, this is a picture of their adult here, so they kind of look like butterflies. They've got very hairy wings. Um, but as, as larvae, um, this is a group that I mentioned actually builds cases. And so this is a, a picture of one that's built a case out of a, a bunch of little pebbles. And then they, they use you know, these sticky secretions to hold it all together. And it's actually where they'll, they'll live. Um, and so that can help them to protect them from getting pushed downstream during high flow events. Um, some of them don't have cases though, and, and those um, generally look more like this. Um, but they all have these little anal hooks at the end of their abdomen, and they either use them to you know, stay inside their case, or they'll, they'll use them to grip you know, rocks and, and various other things to make sure they don't get pushed downstream. Next is Diptera. These are the true flies. Um, these are often sort of the, the maybe the weirdest looking things you'll find in streams. They, they generally look, you know, like like grubs. You know, they don't. You can't always tell if they have a head or not, or maybe which end is the head and which end is the tail very easily. Um, but some of them do. Um, they all have, you know, very clearly segmented bodies as larvae. Um, and they've got a pretty diverse, you know, general morphology and very diverse ecology. Um, 
here at the bottom right is a chironomid. These are really common around here, especially in um, sediments that have low oxygen conditions. Um, so they often turn red when you bring them to the surface due to the, all this hemoglobin that they have, and they use it to um, efficiently obtain oxygen in low oxygen environments. Next up, we've got Coleoptera. These are the beetles. Um, so we did get a, a few cool ones of these here too. Um, the adults often have a, a really hard case and their wings don't overlap. So that's a way you can tell if you're not sure if it's a beetle um, or if it's one of our true bugs, uh, the hemiptera order. Um, look at the wings. Um, so if they overlap, it's likely a, a true bug. Whereas if they don't overlap, it's likely a beetle. Um, and also the mouth parts are different here. Um, so hemipterans always have um, that beak, like I mentioned, um, and beetles generally just have more of like chewing mouth parts that don't look, you know, it's not as prominent as a beak. Um, and there is also very diverse ecology here. Lastly, we've got the order Megaloptera. Um, these are the alder flies and dobson flies. The larvae you can see here, um, another common name is Helgramite. That's pretty common, at least uh, sort of in Kansas. And um, these have the same life cycle as the beetles. Um, their, their mouth parts are very distinct as well. Um, they've got these pretty large pincers that you can see. You see one grasping a, a mayfly here, or a stonefly, sorry. It's two filaments, so it's a stonefly. Um, and they can also bite you if you, if, you know, you let them, and some of them are pretty painful, I've heard. Um, so the mouth parts are a good way to identify these. Um, their abdomen, at least um, for, for this group, um, which is the family Corydalidae, they, they have these, you know, short sort of filaments coming off the side of them. Um, and yeah, like I mentioned earlier on the uh, flowing water slide, they've got hooks at the tip of their abdomen that they use to, to grasp on and prevent themselves from getting pushed downstream. So that'll wrap it up for the most commonly encountered orders. Um, here are links for two keys that we recommend. They're, they're both very helpful. Um, Stroud Center one is a bit easier to use, um, but it's not quite as detailed. And macroinvertebrates.com, uh, once you sort of get the hang of it, uh, it's really interactive. And, and they've got a lot of good images on here that make identification pretty easy. Thanks for listening.